Good morning. Uh, we're in Switzerland. Everything starts on time, ends on time. It's 9 o'clock. And welcome to this uh, session, uh, one of two sessions on the new energy context. This session today is going to focus, this morning is going to focus on the um, technology, economic, and geopolitical drivers of changes in the energy markets. And then a panel this afternoon, uh, chaired by Dan Jurgen, uh, is going to focus on the geopolitical consequences of those, uh, of those changes. So I invite you to come back to the same room. Uh, this afternoon to hear about how the drivers we're going to be talking about this morning are going to be changing, uh, uh, changing the markets and politics. Uh, my name is David Victor. I'm a professor at University of California, San Diego. I run a lab that studies highly regulated industries, especially in the energy market. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Uh, a reminder, this session is uh, being uh, simulcast and is on the record. Um, and please also turn off your electronic devices, your telephones, everything electronic, turn it off. But pacemakers, keep those on, but everything else, please turn it off for the purpose of the flow of the, of, of the session this morning. Um, it's hard to overstate how the drivers we'll be talking about today are changing the whole energy landscape. Uh, we see today a glut of oil. Uh, rooted in part uh, in changes in technology, new supply technologies, lots of other things going on as well. It's driven prices down uh, uh, over the last seven months at the second fastest rate in history. Um, we are seeing a slow but decisive transformation in the global natural gas markets uh, as uh, new supplies, fracking, uh, a variety of other technologies, and globalization through LNG affect the way gas is priced and moved around the global markets. Uh, and in electricity, we see profound changes in supply new renewable technologies, non-renewable technologies competing, new challenges, climate change in particular. Uh, and on the demand side, uh, energy efficiency is really transforming markets in ways that, it, that, that are just unbelievable. It used to be that we always thought that demand for oil, demand for gas, demand for electricity would always rise. We now see in many major markets demand flat or declining, and a big part of that is changes in end use efficiency. So we're going to be talking about these kinds of factors uh, today. Uh, let me briefly introduce the panel from left to right as you're, as you're looking at the panel. Uh, uh, Patrick Poyonet, who is uh, CEO and President of the Executive Committee of uh, Total. Next to him, Deputy Prime Minister Shawis, Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of Iraq. Uh, next to him, Ignacio Sanchez Galan, who is uh, Chairman and CEO of Iberdrola. Um, next to him is Alex Molinoli, who is CEO of Johnson Controls. And uh, to the furthest right is Ulrich uh, Spieshofer, who is CEO of ABB. <clears throat> Um, we're going to start and talk a little bit about oil and gas, then talk about gas and electricity as we move left to right down the panel. Each of the uh, speakers is going to talk for a few minutes in opening remarks. We're going to have a conversation up here, then I'm going to bring you into that conversation, uh, and then we'll finish on time uh, at, uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. So Patrick, let me begin with you. First of all, welcome to your first uh, Davos meeting. Um, you're running uh, uh, one of the world's largest oil and gas companies. Um, you have a global perspective. Um, tell us a little bit about how the changing price environment, change, changing investment environment, how that's shaping where you think the attractive places are to invest. What's on the frontier now? Okay, first of all, when you speak about energy, um, you, you need to have, you have two, two horizons to, to keep in mind. One is a medium and long-term horizons. The world needs energy. The world needs more energy. Why? Because the population is increasing. We need all this new population. We'll need transportation. Part of the emerging countries needs more power. And so in the, you, all, you have to keep that in mind that uh, we take an assumption globally of 1% of growth of linear energy for the coming 20 years. First remark, so we need more energy. Second remark, uh, when you look to the energy mix, the hydrocarbons will remain a big part of it. Uh, but we not think this is really increased in terms of absolute terms, but proportionally they should remain about 70% of the global energy mix in 2035. But that means that most of the growth will be covered by new energies like renewables, like uh, more nuclear, etc. But hydrocarbons will be at the, at the center of the energy mix in 20 years. In hydrocarbons, you have, of course, coal, oil, and gas. For obvious reason, because it was less developed in the past, because it's cleaner, gas share will increase. And coal should decrease. You are not surprised, I'm an oil and gas producer. I'm not a coal producer. I don't intend to become it because of CO2 effect. 
And uh, one of the first message there for an oil and gas company is the gas, is the cleaner energy. We will need hydrocarbons. We will need, we'll increase the production of gas. <laughs> this is important to keep that in the land, main landscape. The other point that you all have to keep in mind, all will remain quite big, around 100 million barrels per day. And it's, maybe it's, I have to repeat it, there is a natural decline in the oil production. So between today and 2030, out of today's production, 100 million barrels per day, 90 million barrels per day, half of the production will disappear because the fields are declining naturally. You can invest to maintain, but you have a natural decline of 5% per year. This means that we will have to invest a huge amount of money around if we want to cope with the request for oil in 2030. Around 50 million barrels per day, it's an enormous amount of investment behind that. And this is why I speak about it, because if you want to meet that oil demand and gas demand, you will need to go and develop technologies and address resources which need higher costs, I mean, which are more expensive, like, of course, tidal, like uh, oil sands, etc. When I go to the short term, what is happening, in fact, is just a commodity, a cyclical a co commodity. We are in a cycle. Oil is a, is a commodity, and you're a cycle. What is a cycle? A cycle is you've seen price I went up, and you have two drivers behind the cycle. It's money and technology. Price went up to one hundred dollar per barrel. A lot of cash came in this industry. A lot of cash means more projects, beginning to tackle with many with more expensive resources. More cash means higher costs as well, also, because the service companies, because we, we requested for better technologies and service companies wanted themselves their share of the cake. So more projects, higher costs also, because as you have more projects, your wood industry has an overheating, and you have more projects, more, more demand than offer. So higher costs. And then also a technology effect, which is thanks to this uh, capital, more possibilities to spend capital, we begin to develop new technologies. It was spectacular in the US. In, 20, in 2007, nobody was speaking about shale gas or even shell oil. It's seven years ago. Why did, they, did we manage to develop shale gas heroes? Because a combination of higher prices and technology. The technology was well known. The fracking is not a new technology. But we, will be, we have been able to develop it because of a price signal. It was becoming, in fact, profitable to frack. It was becoming profitable to develop shell gas at the beginning at uh, the equivalent of $8 per million BTU. The so price went down. And then the technology, the efficiency of the world system, managed to maintain the pace of development. So price and technology. Technology is also important in this commodity business on demand. Because of high prices, People have developed technology to be more energy efficient. It's true in our production processes, but it's also true in the car manufacturing sector. Today, the motors, the transportation, the, the, the new cars as much, have, are much more efficient in terms of consumption of, uh, of oil or of oil than before. So this has an effect on demand. So high price, more projects, higher costs, more technology, yes, more resources, and then Today, what is happening? You have more offer and less demand. Mm. So the cycle. And the cycle will do it in the other way, you know? All is $50. I have announced today that I'm reducing my investments, like all my, co my colleagues, probably. So less investments, less efforts on the energy efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And then come back. The big unknown is how long is the cycle. Mm. And that, in, there are plenty of people is explaining that they know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you. In 2009, mm. it lasts six months. In 1986, it lasts many years. We don't know. But this is the basics of the energy, oil and gas industry. Uh, but main, my last message is on the medium and long term, we need more energy, we need oil. And so the cycle will come back, and the price will come back higher okay. again. Great. Thank you very much. Let's hear from uh, 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 Deputy uh, Prime Minister Shoeis. Uh, Iraq, a lot's happened in Iraq. And yet, there's a tremendous amount of investment. Uh, tell us, tell us uh, why Iraq is so successful now in attracting new investment. Are you worried about this new low-price environment? Or are you, with Patrick and 
prices are going to come back up and it's uh, more investment charging ahead? Well, first of all, when we are speaking about Iraq, then we have to know that Iraq is one of the main oil producing countries in the Middle East. And Iraq has huge uh, reserves of oil, estimated about 140 billion uh, barrel. Beside that, Iraq has also remarkable uh, gas reserves. So it is, how to say it, it is a main player. Iraq is a main player in the energy market. Uh, that's why a lot of, of companies are looking at Iraq as a source of, of oil, gas, energy, what is needed today in the world. And for Iraq itself, uh, crude oil, uh, ex crude oil extraction continued as a, a predominant source of, of generating the gross domestic uh, product at a rate of about 43 to 45%. And revenues from oil makes uh, about 90% of the federal government uh, budget. Uh, this means that Iraq government is very concerned, much concerned, uh, to develop the, the, the oil and gas uh, industry, to have very good relations to all uh, companies who are concerned with, with oil and gas, and at the same time, uh, because of the new challenges, especially uh, the price of, of the oil, Iraq has to uh, try its best to, to rise its uh, uh, oil production and its export. Uh, we are facing challenges in Iraq. Uh, beside the heritage from the old regime, from Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, a semi uh, a semi socialist uh, uh, economy policy uh, corruption social and and political problems we are facing now uh, we are facing now the uh, battle and fight against terrorists, especially IS. We are facing uh, a huge number of ID, ID, IDs. Uh, the number is estimated to be about 2 million people who are uh, displaced internally from areas which are under the control of IS, IS to other safe areas, especially to, to Kurdistan. These all, these all are problems which we have to tackle to uh, found solutions for them. Certainly, Iraq alone cannot do that. We are in need of the cooperation and help of the international community. Uh, coming back to the oil, Iraq has an insufficient infrastructure, uh, oil industry infrastructure, an old one. So a lot of work has to be done in this area. Besides, uh, political problems among the different component of the Iraqi uh, population has lead to a situation where Iraq cannot uh, produce its maximum or export its maximum uh, of its capacity of, of, of oil. Uh, uh, 
I am glad to say that <coughs> the, last, the last agreement between the federal government of Iraq and the region of Kurdistan about the oil policy and about the oil export through the pipelines going through the Kurdistan region will enhance the uh, production of oil and export of oil. It will raise the export of oil to uh, uh, a level of more than 550,000 uh, barrel uh, a day. This means that uh, the Iraqi federal government and also the, the regional government of Kurdistan, both, both of them will benefit from this, this uh, agreement. I'm sure there's going to be some more questions about that when we get, let's get, get some initial views from the other panelists. Let me turn to you, uh, Ignacio Sanchez Galan. Um, your company, Iberdrola, is in making huge investments in renewables and electric power grids. Almost every study, when they look to the future, sees a future that's more electrified, and especially if we reduce carbon emissions. So, so tell us a little bit about where this investment is going to come from and how the changing structure of the energy markets, is, is that making it easier to attract the investment needed, or is it making it harder? Well, perhaps <clears throat> I will try to make a, a short view of what is, uh, the world require in the next few years. So still in the world, there are 1.3 billion people without access to electricity. So that is an issue. So it means that uh, if the energy sector requires investment, in the case of electricity, the sector requires much more investment than anywhere else. So uh, the expectation of growth in electricity demand in the next 40 years, according to International Energy, Energy Agency, is on the range of 80%, so which I think is, is quite a lot. That will require investment in the range of $20 trillion in the next 30 years, so which I think that is the main challenge. Uh, uh, emerging countries, those ones with still in certain cases has not access to electricity, will require almost two-thirds of this investment, but developed countries as well require quite a lot. I think uh, uh, in most of developed countries, networks are becoming obsolete. We are seeing day-to-day -day the blackout with existing countries like the United States. They are already, we are seeing in Europe how we are already, because of the wrong energy policy in certain countries, we are already closing down certain efficient power plants, so because the planning was not correct. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, is uh, one of the, of the uh, opportunities which we have already in this moment. I think in the, in the emerging countries, most of the investment is going to be addressed to build new power generation and new networks. Uh, but I think they have the challenge to not repeat the mistake we have already made in the Western world. Uh, uh, mainly uh, on the area of planning and mainly on the, on the area of regulation. So uh, uh, that's why I think in the World Energy Forum, in the, in the, in the group of electricity which I chair, we have already produced this year a, a, yes, a document, which is what is the future of electricity for developed countries. And we are planning to make another one, what is the future of electricity for, uh, for, new, for the emerging countries, just precise, to try to see what are the challenges. So uh, 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 the main thing which uh, uh, we, uh, we address in this document is how to address, how to uh, uh, raise the, uh, uh, the, the, the huge amount of money with this investment, uh, for this investment with the country require. The first thing is uh, a strong plan is, a strong planning and to make the right choice of the right technologies. We have already made in the Western world quite a lot of mistakes in certain areas. We have already invested heavily in certain renewables in an in a, in a immature uh, period. So which I think that is already producing in this moment a tremendous problem of competitiveness of the, in the electricity supply. We have already to control properly, uh, the, they have to control properly uh, to make an adequate implementation of this investment. And by far the most important thing is to make already a stable, predictable, a well-designed regulatory framework. We have certain examples in this moment in countries which are already now in a growing period, like Mexico, which just recently has already made this energy reform, has already made the President Peña Nieto, which is already a good example how to address, how to change the situation of a country, how to attract investment. So uh, uh, renewables, uh, Iberdrola, as you mentioned, we are the largest by far investor in the world. We are more than 25 billion uh, euros invested in, in renewables. But we try for all means to invest in those 
one which are more mature. So those things which are immature can already uh, live for a certain period of time under a good, uh, uh, let's say, subsidy period, but that is not ready a, a real uh, uh, a balanced uh, situation at uh, long term. The consumer have to pay for it, and the politician has already this sensibility, and they will change the rules, as we are already facing. So I think those are the main address. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, next I'd like to hear um, uh, from Alex Molinaroli, uh, CEO of Johnson Controls. Alex, your company is investing heavily in a whole range of energy efficiency technologies. Tell us a little bit about what you see as the most important technologies and how they're going to change the way users interface with the energy system. Well, I, I'm, I'm a little unique on this panel because we've talked about supply side quite a bit. And, and the choices that have to be made and how those choices are made. At, at, some, at some point within the, this, this cycle or, or um, uh, process, you have to have decisions have to be made based off of what the user, uh, what the user requires. So whether it's in buildings or whether it's in vehicles, decisions are being made by the consumers that are forcing different supply sources, different uh, pricing mechanisms, uh, you know, along with regulations, but as these choices are being made, one of the things we really don't talk about is is the ability to make those choices and how those choices are going to be made in a way that's not only efficient but effective. Because you can apply all these technologies, and and if if you were able to have a theoretical system that was most efficient, we have plenty of energy that's being supplied today. Uh, it's usually just in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, and the, and at the wrong cost, uh, but. But with the choices that are being made and the technologies that exist within both vehicles uh, and, um, and buildings and residences, uh, those choices will become uh, easier to make. And I think we're going to find ourselves, certainly in the mature company, uh, countries, that we're going to see less and less demand. Uh, you know, as an example, you can look at we're both in the vehicle business and the buildings business. In the, in the vehicle business today, uh, just because of the just because of the rise of of legislation and alternative technologies, fuel efficiency of vehicle of of the combustion engine, uh, which was under attack, is is not going to go away. And I'm sure the technologies that you see in in the supply side of energy, you have you have pressure from new technologies that's going to for, more, force more efficiency in the supply. And so I think all these things are are building an ecosystem that allows smart choices. Uh, and if we're able to have those smart choices, we can lose less energy and also get the energy to the right places. And I, and I think having a connected system, both from the supply side to the demand side, is, is, is critical in order to make that happen. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to come back in just a moment and ask you some more questions about the surprises on the demand side. But first, let me get the last initial comment from Ulrich Spieshofer, who's a, a CEO of ABB. Your company sits kind of between supply and end user. Do you agree with what Alex has said? Tell us about some of the other technological surprises you see um, uh, in this whole space. So thank you, David. If you look at the biggest challenges of mankind in the next decades, one of them is to decouple economic growth from environmental pollution. And the way we're going to get there is by making sure for every unit of GDP output, we use less energy. And for every energy unit that's still needed, we use the environmentally most friendly technology to produce it. Electricity is coming stronger and stronger in focus. There's more energy by wire than ever before. First, the rail industry moved from coal to diesel to electricity. Now we see electric cars coming. So the focus that I want to take is on electricity. If you look at power generation, in 20 years' time, 40% of the global installed uh, energy uh, capacity, electricity uh, capacity, will be renewables. This might be further accelerated by a simple fact. We talk about the negative impact of the falling oil price. There's about half a trillion, $500 billion spent every year on subsidies for fossil fuel. In India alone, it's 30 billion, more, between 30 and 40 billion a year. The redirection of that money might accelerate further renewable technologies. Renewable technology on the power generation side means more volatility, 
less predictability, higher intermittence. That means we need to have a wider connection of generation sources to ensure we can balance off the different pieces. We need to make sure over the longer distances that renewable require, because you don't build renewable power plants in the city of New York, you need to have lower loss technology. And we recently saw many good developments, whether it's above ground or underground power transmission and distribution, lower loss, higher capacity technology will really help to make the renewable dream happen. On the distribution side, as said before by one of the colleagues here, more than a billion people don't have access to electricity today. New technology on microgrid and nanogrid level, where you bring together renewables, some conventional backup, energy storage and local distribution will enable the 600 million people in Africa, the 400 million people in India that don't have access to electricity to get that done in a more sustainable way. If you look at the points of consumption, energy efficiency is the key theme and it's still highly undervalued and uh, doesn't get enough attention. There is a simple device that we have in our offering. It's a drive which controls the consumption of, of electrical motors, which stand for about 30 to 40 percent of the global energy consumption. Putting this drive into action the last couple of years, we already save every year the equivalent of 100 million households' energy consumption. And we need to get more going on the energy efficiency side, using the technology in a smart way. So all together, using the technology smartly will allow us to run the world without consuming the earth. Great, thank you very much. So let, let me ask a, each of the panelists a, a question or two, and then we'll put it open to the audience. Let me start with you, Alex. Um, Patrick and Ignacio both quoted widely read studies about increasing demand for energy. Yet I sensed in your remarks that there's potentially huge surprises on the demand side, that maybe the energy industry, in fact, doesn't really understand its customers very well. And with new technologies, the customers are going to react in ways and total demand is going to go down. How plausible is that? Are you seeing a future where demand, at least for primary energy, maybe not ultimate energy like illumination, but primary energy actually could go down in a substantial way? And is that going to be massively disruptive to these markets? Oh, I think it already is. I think that part of what, what, what you're seeing today is, the, particularly in the mature economies, uh, you're, you're seeing the, the use of, of energy become much more efficient and effective. Uh, grids are better than they were. Uh, we have made progress. Uh, buildings and vehicles are more efficient. Uh, the ability to use distributed energy sources is much more uh, plausible, be enforced as a, unintended consequences mm -hmm. of renewables. All these things are happening that I think is putting pressure on, on the system. I think that regulators are probably really in the way of making that really happen. If, if we, uh, particularly in, in mature economies, uh, you know, regulations protect the status quo, and that incumbency, I think, is really what, what is going to slow down what I think is something that is disruptive. There's an awful lot going on, and when you get to the, the, the emerging economies, uh, they'll take advantage of, of the uh, technologies that are in place today. Uh, they don't have to rebuild a grid, they have to build one. They don't have to rebuild a communication system, they have to put one in. Uh, you can't help but connect things to the internet when you put a device in today. And so I think that we're going to see the pace at which an emerging economy becomes much more efficient and effective mm. be much quicker than what we ever saw in the mature economies. So I saw many heads nodding, but let me, I didn't see yours. Uh, yours was shaking. Do you disagree with that view, Patrick? Yeah, I disagree. I mean, I agree fully with the mature economies. I agree that the emerging countries will have access quickly to more, more modern technologies. But the population of the world is just increasing, as somebody said, I think, to you. Three billion of people don't have access to power today. And we cannot just have a world where we have split in two parts, where some people have access to energy, to affordable energy, mm -hmm. and others would not have access to that. And I think it's just some fundamentals. I think it's, uh, when we speak about sustainable development, it's not just only a question of environmental matters. It's also primary for me, a question of social development. And we have to, 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 to organize the world in a way that these people will have access to energy, reliable and affordable. And that's true that some of these uh, energies are quite expensive. And uh, we have to keep that in mind, even if, frankly, even total, you know, we, have, we, we are today, it's not well known, the second uh, solar company in the world 
in terms of equipment, providing equipment. So we believe in these technologies, we, but it does not mean that at the same time we will need, not need the more traditional ones, maybe more efficient, but we will need to bring this technology to all these populations. Okay, so two pretty different views here on something that I think a lot of us thought we, we knew a lot about, which is demand for energy. Let me ask you, Ulrich, um, tell us a little bit about how the business model is going to change. Um, seems like one of the logical extensions of the arguments that several people have been making about new technologies is that with new renewables and more responsive customers and so on, that the value chain, the value in the value chain is not necessarily going to flow to the traditional companies, big electric utilities and so on. Do you see this as fundamentally disrupting their business? Do you see the big utilities as dinosaurs of the past and new kinds of companies coming in? Are the regulators in the way of that process? Look, there's definitely fields where we will see some disruption. I recently sat down with Mukesh Ambani in India and had good discussions regarding Africa. And as my colleague from Johnson Controls just said, if you take the economies where there is no electricity supply today for large parts of the population, you need to look at the total system cost of setting up electricity supply to an individual. In the past, you needed to build a street to an African village. You need to get the petrol truck coming in there. You build up the diesel-powered uh, generation and uh, generator, and you off you go. Today, you don't put that in. You don't put in the subsidies to get the fuel cheap to the village. You put in a solar park. You combine it with storage. And you might still have some backup. And uh, I give Patrick really a point. You might need some back backup. So I think the, a smart coexistence and a new emergence of business models is coming. And then if you look at the, 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 the development of the electricity value chain and the development of communication, a village in India, the people have a couple of, of needs. The one is they want to have electricity to power up their mobile phone, their fridge, and their TV. But they also want to do something with their mobile phone in terms of being connected. So at the, as the time, as we put in electricity, Somebody else might be putting in wireless communication networks to allow the people to get connected to the world. So it's a coexistent. We will not have a total revolution in the traditional economies turning tomorrow upside down. But we will have a more stronger perseverance and a higher speed of development. And the going down of the oil prices at the moment, a lot of people say it will beat the renewables. On Monday, I was at the Future Energy Week in Abu Dhabi, kicking it off together with Dr. Sultan of, 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 of uh, uh, the United Emirates. And he said, in front of all the oil companies and all the oil players, he said, the time where the oil price dominates the deployment of renewables is over. Because the cost of renewables have gone down so massively, especially on the solar side, that there is an acceleration coming. And there needs to be a new model of coexistence coming. Let me ask you, Ignacio, your company is the biggest investor in this space. Do you agree with that assessment, that this, uh, the, the time when the oil price, and therefore the price of natural gas in most of the world, basically determines what's feasible and renewables or not, that that time is, is, is now over? So uh, I, I was commenting uh, that there are two, two kind of countries. Those countries with today's has already yes, uh, a good networks and, and certain efficient power plant. And those countries have not ready networks. They have to decide what is the electricity system they would like to design. So uh, I think today they are technological solution for making already distributed energy. So it's uh, today, but long time ago exists as well. Today is more, more economically viable than it was. But my concern is that uh, we can create already a bubble I think it had already been created in Europe with certain renewable technologies. Because the fact is these distributed technologies, which I think is a good solution for countries, which they have to decide if to build or not to build a network uh, and to build or not to be a big power plant, if it's more efficient to make a small one just to make it for provide electricity to certain areas without mm -hmm. connection with the rest of the system, if that, if that is the decision, the fact is today what is being built is just for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, more than an uh, energy solution is a financial product in certain cases. They are already, uh, those countries we have already, or those people have already access 
a good wealth, and they are already capabilities of investing in, in their own power plan. They are already avoiding things of that to pay, and that is the case of Europe. Almost 50% of the cost of the bill, which is charges and, tar and rates and taxes, things of producing for themselves. So they are being created, in, in particular in Europe, in certain cases in the state as well, some, some lack of solidarity, because those people who have already more wealth are those people which are able to build their own service, their own power plant. They are already as well, they can serve and they can use as backup the existing network, paying almost nothing for the service. And those ones who have not already wealth, or those ones who have not already uh, such a possibility of building this, their own uh, 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 cell production have to pay not only their cost, but as well the cost and the taxes that another one are avoiding. So let's try and insist on the good, uh, uh, fair regulation. Technologies exist for those countries who have not already connected. The good solution is those ones which should be economic and more viable. Let me, I'm not sure then the solar in a more scale, I agree with solar, I agree with wind. I'm not sure then the small solar power plant will be more efficient than the large ones. We can make a large one solar, large, large, large one wind, or large one hydro, which all of them are renewables, in areas which are connected, which always will be more efficient than the small one making for their own. Let me quickly ask you, uh, for countries, many countries already have grids, you said in your opening remarks, that there have been a lot of bad choices with technologies around renewables, a lot of very expensive solutions. You gave some examples of countries that are engaging in good reforms, and I think the lower energy prices are opening a lot of opportunities for reforms. You conspicuously didn't say anything about Europe as a model of good reforms, and yes, there's a new push for lower emissions, more renewables in Europe. Um, what's your view? Is, is this uh, new push on renewables going to be horrifically expensive, or is it on the right track? So, uh, no, I, I Briefly think on it, this, and then I want to ask Patrick, and then we'll come back to the deputy. Just to so, uh, I think in, the, in this particular scenario, so there, with the low energy prices in this moment, it's a unique opportunity in, in Europe to accelerate the process of uh, go to the ETS, to go to the reserve mechanism for uh, putting already a floor for the CO2. So I think uh, European Union and the actual new commissioner, Cañete, and the new vice president of the, for European Union has already a difficulty, is that Europe has, has already lost tremendous competitiveness toward Americans, among others because of a lack of a proper regulation, putting charges on the bill which makes almost 50% of the cost. Now, thanks to reduction of the uh, 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 oil and gas prices, that can already be introduced certain measures which incentivate the transfer of one technology to another one without increasing the prices and reducing, the, the, reducing in this way the cost for all the consumers. So I think far from being a negative effect, I think it's a positive one for accelerating the process for migration, for clean technologies, using the particular moment that we are living okay. in this moment. I mean, that's a possibility. We haven't yet seen yeah. it happen. Do you want to comment very briefly uh, on uh, this? Just Patrick one comment? remark on solar. We are very engaged in solar. I would like to everybody to know the facts. Today the capex per megawatt of solar is more expensive than the capex per megawatt of nuclear. That's the truth. So people believe that because it's clean and solar, it's less not expensive. That's not true at all. And this is why, by the way, we are engaged in that technology, because we believe there is a, a lot of improvement to be, to be done. Mm -hmm. But it's very expensive. And it's not because it's renewable, but it's cheap. Okay. That's not true. Great, thank you very much. Let me I, come will, I will hear some, some, thing, some chart. We are not going to have line. a dispute about the capex of nuclear no, no, and solar no. right now, but we will come back to that no, uh, later. Let me just ask, last question here, and then I want to open the audience. Um, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Chauvis, um, you talked about, in your opening remarks, the tremendous security needs in Iraq. You talked about the tremendous needs for improving infrastructure to expand exports, although a lot's happened already. Tremendous progress. Your government a month ago uh, adopted a new budget that is much leaner than the previous expected budget because of lower oil price. Help us understand um, a little bit about what's going to happen here. Because it would seem like, on the one hand, lower oil prices are going to create a lot of pressure on the government and make it hard to deliver infrastructure and security and so on that are essential. On the other hand, they're going to force companies like Patrick's uh, many others to look around the world for the most competitive places to invest, and Iraq is maybe a tremendous offer there. So help us understand how this low price environment is going to affect the ability of Iraq to compete with other countries to attract this investment. Yes. 
First of all, it is true that Iraq, the federal government has lost about 50% of its revenues through the oil prices, through the oil prices. And I don't know whether it is true or not, we are still in Iraq believing that the oil prices will rise. It is not permanent, the situation, and there should be some regulation in the prices. And also, I think it is also the duty of the international uh, community not just to think to, to lower the price of the energy for Europe or other countries, but to think about the oil producing countries also by such uh, uh, low prices. In Iraq, uh, we are facing uh, complex uh, problems and, and challenges. And certainly the oil price is one of the newest challenges and uh, it affects directly all the uh, sites of life in Iraq. Uh, what should be done in Iraq to address its challenges? First of all, it is uh, very important to stabilize the internal political scene. There should be a mutual understanding between the political forces which are representing the, the components of the Iraqi population. Without the stabilizing the, the political situation, we cannot turn over and stabilize the, the security situation. And if we have a, a civilized political situation and security situation, then the doors are open for investments in Iraq, mm -hmm. in all parts of Iraq, not in a certain regions where, where, which are the case now. Uh, besides that, it is the duty of the Iraqi government to take uh, effective steps to improve the administrative and financial performance of the government institutions itself. We have seriously and urgently to battle the corruption and put in place new laws and mechanisms that enable securing additional funds through mechanisms not, not so common in Iraq, such as issuing government bonds, loans, etc. Also, we have to take urgent steps to boost the role of the private sector, especially the private banks, and utilize the revenues from the energy itself to boost industrial, agriculture, and service sectors. Thank you very much for that. Let me just uh, uh, stop you there so we have a chance for some questions. Uh, uh, please. Identify yourself over here. Identify yourself when a microphone comes and um, ask your question briefly. Um, hi, David. It's Steve, Steve Howard from IKEA. Uh, more of a comment than a question. I think when we're comparing technologies, uh, we've got to look compare not just CapEx but OpEx. And this, I was thinking this decommissioning X as well. CapEx, OpEx, and decommissioning X when we're comparing things. We're not a bedroller, but we've invested about uh, two billion dollars in wind and solar. We find it a really... 25 billion. You, no, we've done two. Ah, sorry. You're, uh, you're ten, ten times ahead of us. But, uh, and but, but yours comes with an instruction booklet. <laughs> yeah, a forge, and, and uh, successfully assembled as well. <laughs> um, and we find renewables a very attractive investment and, uh, because we've got full transparency of the costs after we've installed them. Um, and we can see we've started selling solar for customers in several markets. And it's fantastically attractive for people. If you look at the price development, renewables will win the energy debate. Uh, we just haven't realized it yet. Maybe some of us have, but renewables are winning the energy debate. Let me just ask Alex uh, this question. Um, what's the biggest surprise you've seen as you learn more about what customers, consumers actually want? What's the most surprising thing you've seen? Well, I, customers don't want I'll give you a good example. Um, customers don't really want electric cars. They want cars that are more efficient. Uh, and I think that plays out. Um, and you could take that across any 
um, any technology. Customers want, uh, they, they want, they want technologies that pay for themselves. They want technologies uh, that work, and they want uh, they want technologies that are reliable. And they would like to they would like to save energy both from their pocketbook standpoint and for the right things. Um, I, I would say that we have to be careful that we don't focus on technology for technology's sake. Mm -hmm. One of the unintended consequences of uh, I'll use cars for uh, for a minute um, because we're in the battery business is that that. Um, Electric vehicles, 30, 40,000, 50,000 vehicles a year. Uh, if you look at just something simple like start-stop technology in Europe, that's taken the, the, that's taken a million and a half cars off the road. If you look at what you, you know, what kind of uh, benefit that technology has brought. So I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that are happening mm -hmm. around efficiency and technologies that work that really go unnoticed. Next question here. Hi, it's uh, Kamal Ahmed from the BBC. It's a question for Mr. Uh, Piane. Um, can you tell me what the low oil price means for a business like yours when you're approaching the future for your mature fields? And I'm thinking in particular, obviously, for the UK, that means the North Sea um, in terms of investment. And do you think to yourself that in the longer term, those mature fields are going to take a lower and lower um, uh, proportion of your investment? And secondly, what are the government and regulators, when they're thinking about how to support mature fields, what are government and regulators, what should they be doing? Should they now be looking at cutting taxes and encouraging you to invest more in those mature fields? Yeah, you know, mature fields in, in North Sea, uh, of course, it's, it's capex intensive. You want to maintain, to fight against the decline of mature fields. Uh, the policy, what happened in the last years is that we invested more in these fields, so they have a new life, because the payout was quite short. If you divide by two uh, the, uh, the price of the oil price, the payout is twice longer. And so we will not allocate the same amount of capex. And the UK taxation has been increased, like the Norwegian taxation has been increased. But in the past, UK authorities have been flexible about it. I think it's the interest of the country to try to adapt its, its taxation system if they want to encourage investments. But obviously, and I, it's not a, uh, among the cuts that we will down in 2015, the allocation of capital in the, uh, capex to this type of mature fields will be diminished, that's true. So we'll see what will be the answer of the regulators. But it will be the case not only in mature fields, all over the world. We have to adapt ourselves, and uh, even if we keep a long-term strategy, again, I speak long-term, short-term, but you know when we have embarked in uh, greenfield projects, we, we cannot stop them. We have, to, we have to maintain them. So the part of the capital and the in investments that we can arbitrate is mainly, mainly uh, on this type of mature firms. Next question here, please, sir. Stefan Danda with uh, Royal DSM. We are active in advanced biofuels from agriculture waste and in solar. Uh, two questions, uh, one for Mr. Molina Roli and Mr. Spieshofer. I have not heard anything about uh, energy storage development and energy, energy storage, obviously very important for renewables. And for Monsieur Pouyanné, uh, you talked about the sustainability aspects from a social uh, point of view, but uh, obviously there is also the environmental story. Do you expect the more aggressive price on carbon anytime soon in the different geographies that you are active in. Thank you. Why don't we start with that one? $100 a ton? <laughs> I think the question there is a, a worldwide question. Uh, I think we need to price, and we have signed, I have signed my advice for my first act as a CEO. I've signed a declaration where I support the price of the CO2. But I think we need the floor, you probably need the ceiling as well as long as it's not across the, at least the developed economies. Because Europe, from that point of view, is a leader, but uh, we can be a leader if we are alone. It will have little impact on the global warming, uh, global warming if we just destroy jobs in Europe. I can assure you. And one other dollar per ton, if we are alone to do that, the whole heavy industry will disappear in Europe. So as long as the other countries, in particular the developed countries, it's a question of, of I am devil's here, of global competition, if you put a burden on certain parts of the world, then it has an impact. At one hundred dollar per ton, refining and petrochemical per in Europe disappear in five years. Let's be clear. That's true. So I am 
advocating to, for a price of CO2 because it's good to make a signal. It will be not only the only answer to the global warming, but it's part of the global solution. But we need also probably to be reasonable and to have a sort of, of feeling. I think, you know, when we set up in Europe the European currency system in the old times, you had a sort of snake. And I think it would be good to try to maneuver our CO2 price. Maybe it's what, by the way, with uh, your mechanism, this complex mechanism that we want to put in place to stabilize the system, is what we're trying to achieve. But I think, so yes, for a price, but it's not the whole solution. Don't believe that. Let's just get uh, quickly, Ignacio, on this. You know, if you have a floor and a ceiling, pretty soon you have a tax, so that we could see the end of, oh. in effect, the end of But you know, a tax systems. in Europe, you need unanimity. A floor okay. and a ceiling, you don't need it. Ignacio, very briefly, then I want to get these guys in on storage. Very quickly, but I think probably the last opportunity of uh, the world for doing something serious in terms of emission is the next summit in Paris. Unless all we agree to do something in this respect, the world is going, and the world means all of us, we're going to suffer. I think we are already putting the short term in front of what the world we would like to leave to our children. So we are already doing something which is not absolutely right. Another point on related uh, energy storage, I've been mean, as well in some time, we were partners of yourself in, uh, in, in, in storage, but I think they are a very good storage, which nobody talks about as, as well because of lack of regulation, which is pumping storage. So the hydro pumping storage can already accumulate huge amount of energy. In the moment, the renewables energy is already not a need, but I think, unfortunately, with the exception of certain companies, what we are doing for our own, without any support of the public uh, sector, we, the solution exists. I think the rest of the solution, using small batteries, et cetera, is nice for the small devices. In a huge scale, the only uh, industrial solution is pumping storage. So using the reversible power plant, hydro power plant, to pump ha water up and down in the moment that is needed. I mean, but I think Switzerland has, Spain we have, in certain countries will require as well. It's not sexy, but it's gravity and it works. We know how to make it work. Uh, briefly, guys, uh, uh, Alex and Ulrich, are you seeing transformative things in the storage, uh, or is basically it's going to be pumping water is so far the dominant solution? Well, if it works, why not do it? I, I don't think that, uh, I think this chasing technology is important as it relates to, as it relates to energy storage or any energy system, but I think there's technologies that do work today. You have to apply the right, right technology in the right application. You know, somebody talked about uh, distributed solar systems. You can't do that without some sort of energy storage system. There's batteries everywhere in the world and other energy storage devices. You know, of, the four, of, the, of the four billion people that need power, a billion of them only are going to get power through a set of batteries and, and, uh, and solar um, energy. So I, I think that I think the battery the, the battery industry is not as bad as what people would say around costs. I think technologies are being misapplied, and I think regulations are driving some things that um, that just don't make a lot of sense. So sometimes incentives force you to do things that just don't make a whole lot of sense. So, for and example, what California is doing, which I is think California is a great is, example is of, of what is. Uh, not only is it not a good idea, but it's also creating, you know, multiple technologies and is creating a, a, a system that's too expensive for, for the rest of the world. All right. I couldn't agree more. Basically, if you look at affordable energy storage will really change the world. And whether it's hydrocarbon for mass storage, uh, hydro, hydro pumps uh, for mass storage, or whether that's local batteries, it is really changing. And if you look at it today, the battery density and the battery cost of electric cars will go down by about 70% in the next five years. So you get the same amount of, for the same amount of cost, you're going to get three times the, the, the storage capacity in the next couple of years. You're going to put these batteries into households. Uh, and you have a solar system combined with a battery that we're already offering today, and you have ba basically a pretty autonomous uh, system, but as one of the speakers says before, that is not enough mass to get going. So I think we need to play the grand piano on all the different storage technology, apply them to the different segments where they make the most sense, and then we can have a great coexistence between renewables as a backup of conventional systems and storage technologies. Mm -hmm. Let me see if we can uh, time. So may, may, what, I, may I add one point? Uh, let's just, I want to get one more question in here uh, before we run out of time. Please, sir. So uh, Anthony Goldblum from Kaggle. Uh, Mr. Poyanet uh, spoke about the fact that we're in the bottom of a cycle at the moment. 
Um, people talk about decline rates in tight oil fields very, being very fast, and that might mean that cycles are much faster nowadays than they've been historically. Love to hear your reaction to that. On tight oil, uh, I'm, uh, I think, you know, people underestimate today the capacity of the system, in particular the U.S. industry, to, uh, to react in terms of efficiency. We've seen that in the shale gas. We'll see that in the shale oil. I think uh, there is a room for improvement, a huge room for improvement. You have to know that uh, today around 80 percent of the shale tight oil uh, production has a cost of under, under $70 per barrel. It's quite easy, I think, to drop that cost to something around under $50 per barrel. Having said that, there is a limitation, which is the financing system, the cash. Because what today it will hurt the U.S. independence is more to have access to cash, because they are leveraging a lot, even if the interest rates. So you will see, and you have seen the announcements, most of, most of them are announcing investment costs by 40 percent for next year, which is quite big. So it will have an impact. But then I believe we, we don't have to underestimate the capacity of being more efficient and of technology and the rule adaptation of the U.S. oil industry. Uh, another point is that unconventional are very capital intensive, but offer flexibility. So if you want to stop your investment, and we will do that, we have some fields in the U.S. on, uh, on the eastern coast, my instruction is clear. We will limit this year the, the capital investment there. Why? Because I will not drill somewhere else during one year. I can come back in one year when the oil price and gas price will come back. So flexibility plus access for financing, which is not my case, I'll be clear, but it's more arbitration. <laughs> uh, but I have to, to do my part of the job also if I want the price to come back. Uh, access, flexibility plus access to financing on the, in smalls will have an impact. But another point, all that in oil and gas, you have a sort of inertia. It's quite resilient. So you don't see a big drop quickly. So, but, so this is a complex issue, and I think I'm more believing what I said before, that the impact on the low price will affect your decline rate on the mature fields, which has a big impact at the end of the day on the production, rather than all, on all these new resources. You have other resources which are much more expensive, like old sands, for example. One more question? Please, last question here. Ken Hirsch, NGP Energy Capital Management in the States. Um, Mr. Pawani, uh, you seem to be talking up, uh, past each other. You focus on uh, the petroleum system. There's a billion cars and trucks in the world. Um, the rest of the panel is talking about electricity, which is a minority of energy, um, and it's actually not an energy source. Um, how do we, if, if we had a convergence between transportation and electricity, what would be the incremental demand that would be needed in natural gas, and other energy um, electricity producers. Let me see if anybody wants to, to comment on that. Let me ask it instead of a, uh, um, Alex, did you want to comment on this? Uh, I, I, you, you don't have the microphone anymore. I, I'm not sure I, I, I got the question completely. Let, let me, let me uh, summarize. Let me first summarize this factually, and then I want to ask a question technologically, which is, the, the work that's been done, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, for example, has done a bunch of work in this area. And the overall impact, increased demand for electricity for a big shift to electric cars is surprisingly small. It's in the kind of 10% range, order of magnitude. So that's not transformative. It's not zero, but it's not transformative. But I just want to ask um, uh, the panel very quickly, do, do you see electric vehicles um, as creating this convergence between oil and then gas and electricity? Or do you think they're going to remain a niche, a niche product? Alex? Well, I have a strong opinion. Um, I, I, well, it comes back to economics. And, and I think unless you're uh, the, to 2 to 3 percent of early adopters that were adopters of, of hybrids and now electric vehicles, uh, the technology, regardless of uh, prices coming down 70 percent, for things like electric vehicles or plug-ins, is just not going to pay for itself. The consumer, the consumer looks at vehicles in a three-year time cycle. So you may get to 5 percent, um, but what's, what it is going to do, um, which is, doesn't answer your question completely, it's going to force uh, the combustion engine and the technology to become more and more efficient. That's what really will happen. Last comment on this one? I think, I think it depends greatly on the region of the world where you go. If you take China as an example as a market for electric vehicles, today 17 million electric scooters on the street. 
65% uh, of the fuel being imported through the South China Sea, uh, where there is a lot of political tension. There are different reasons why certain parts of the world will really push electric vehicles in a very strong way to become, become more ind uh, independent of electric fuels, uh, of, of conventional fuels. So altogether, we will see some markets where electric vehicles are, are coming at lightning speed, and we see it at the moment, the deployment in parts of the world. In other parts, I'm fully with Alex. Mm -hmm. It might be going a little bit slower, but push down the, the hurdles uh, for um, efficiency needs for conventional vehicles. Okay, great. Well, tremendous changes underway across the energy business. Uh, in some sense, the uncertainties are going up. Uh, things that we thought we knew we maybe don't know anymore, like future demand um, and certainly the future price of major uh, uh, energy sources. Please, it's, not, it's 10 o'clock, it's Switzerland, we're going to finish now. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.